Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, on this uh, session. Uh, I will be discussing a very important topic uh, that affects journalists and um, journalism in general. So quick background uh, for me, uh, two major crises in recent times have highlighted the delicate nature of refugees. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic shows that refugees, uh, especially those in crowded refugee camps, are extremely vulnerable to the virus. And in many settings are not a priority for COVID vaccination. And um, many uh, refugees are still in the middle of their struggle, uh, not simply uh, against war, uh, persecution or famine, but against COVID-19, even though the world seems uh, to be moving on already. And uh, in the wake of the humanitarian crisis that arose uh, from Russia's attack on Ukraine, uh, prejudice against refugees, uh, especially due to their nationalities, uh, were played out in real time as some journalists uh, inadvertently implied that refugees uh, from Ukraine uh, ought to be regarded differently uh, than those from places like Syria or Africa. So this was a rude awakening moment uh, for journalism, and uh, this probably happened uh, globally. And which is why on June 28th, uh, the World Refugee Day uh, 2022 uh, was celebrated. And the focus this year uh, is on the right uh, to seek uh, safety. According to the organizers of this uh, celebration, every person on this planet has a right uh, to seek safety, uh, wherever they are, wherever they come from, and whenever they are forced uh, to leave. And today at the ICF Day, Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting, uh, we are marking uh, this celebration with a session on how to report on refugee communities. And we have an amazing panelist of today, two amazing panelists with us. Uh, we have Louine uh, and uh, Ivan Mudok, and they are both uh, veteran, uh, veteran reporters. And uh, so Mudok, by introduction, how are you doing Mudok, are you there? Good, how are you? Yes, thank you very much. So Mudok is an award-winning journalist and uh, is uh, the Middle East correspondent for Voice of America, uh, currently based in Istanbul. Uh, Mudok covers the Middle East and North Africa uh, for VOA. She has reported across the Middle East and Africa in countries in Europe uh, during the European refugee crisis and on the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, Louis, on the other hand, how are you doing, Louis? Are you there with us? Hi, Paul. Yes, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, Louis is the chief of VOA's uh, Burmese service. Uh, uh, joining the VOA in 2004, Louis, after working for the BBC uh, for more than a decade as a broadcast journalist. And during the 2002 article, uh, he also worked with the international NGO Internews to establish the first uh, Burmese journalism school uh, in Thailand. And uh, but Louis's uh, story is even more harrowing because uh, he was once uh, a refugee himself. And I think Louis will tell us about uh, that background. And based on that, I just want to thank our panelists uh, for taking time to join us today. And our, our forum members uh, and those that are interested in this topic of discussion. As usual, we're always excited in knowing where you're joining us from. So if you're in the chat box, you can enter, tell us where you're joining us from today. And uh, our speakers might decide to uh, probably localize or say some things that are specific for your geographical location. So please and please let us know where you are joining us from, where it's that you are being with us. And um, if our adventure you are watching this live stream and you also want to engage with us, um, we are glad that you can also do that. Do not wait to the end of the session of the presentations for you to ask your questions. We already have some questions that we mailed in already uh, to our speakers, and we are going to treat those questions at a time being. And um, so do, that done, uh, we'll start uh, sharing the screen because they have a presentation for us that we'd like to take uh, before we start engaging our audience with interactive session. So um, can you share the screen, Gary? While we are waiting for the presentation, oh, it's here already. And uh, if you don't know by now, like I said, uh, this session is being uh, put together uh, uh, through um, a very, the very nice support of the Voice of America. So uh, we've done a lot of sessions together and we hope to still do a lot of sessions together. The VOA has amazing array of very good training, trainers and journalists. So we are glad that they're able to work with us on putting this together. 
So um, over to you. I'll be back with interactive sessions. What else can do we? You can take it from here. Thank you, Paul. Um, so uh, as he said, I'm a journalist for Voice of America. My main job is a field journalist. And I work in the Middle East and Africa mostly. I mean, recently, like everyone else, Ukraine as well. But um, most of my experience has been in Africa and the Middle East. And most of my work has to do with conflicts and more specifically with people fleeing conflicts and sometimes uh, natural disasters as well, but mostly um, wars. Um, uh, Lewin, do you want to take a moment to explain why you're here? What brings you here today? Yeah, that will be a little bit um, uh, also introducing myself. Plus, that, uh, that, that will, I would like to bring you to know what I'm going to say something about that. So, uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Heather. Uh, my name is Stan Luen Ton, uh, uh, Luen, and uh, I'm a, a chief of the Burmese service of the Voice of America. We broadcast uh, 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 radio and television to direct to Myanmar or Burma, now they call it. Uh, so we have a, a US AGM 24 seven uh, uh, dedicated uh, television stations and we produce content from Washington DC. And I have uh, a few correspondents back in Burma and as well as in a, some sort part of Southeast Asia to cover the issue in Burma. So, uh, uh, I've been uh, with the VOA for about nearly 20 years. So this uh, refugee issue is a very much a kind of a personalized issue to me, as uh, Paul briefly mentioned about that. So I, uh, I was uh, kind of a, uh, buzzing through my life as a kind of a displaced person. Uh, to be honest, it is a kind of, I started at a center back in 20 more, uh, 1988 as a student uh, activist. So because of my, I was uh, studying at the time uh, uh, in a college final year to become a medical doctor, three months to go to become a, a doctor, but uh, the political uprising came up and then uh, because of my student activities, I expelled from uh, school and then a lot of my colleagues being killed and uh, arrested. So fear of my own life and security or safety, I have to flee the country and arrive in the big jungle of the Thailand Burma border, where we uh, we get together again and then uh, form a kind of an armed resistance force, very idealistic at that time. Anyhow, anyway, we are living along the uh, Thai Burma border as a kind of a uh, armed resistance force. But nearby at the time, while we were there for uh, two years, we I'm, I'm, I saw a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, displaced settlement where the few villagers nearby come and uh, stay and uh, kind of uh, take a refuge and also the refugee camps along the Thailand Burma border. So during my that time at the time as a kind of a medical uh, medic and I, I saw a lot of uh, uh, children or uh, adults who were killed or who died unnecessarily because of only diarrhea or malaria or infection from the wound or something like that. So that kind of, uh, and also I work with a lot of uh, uh, kind of a relief uh, organizations uh, together to organize the things. So, so these are the kind of uh, uh, whatever experience I like to share in my uh, earlier life. Later on, I arrived in the um, uh, England to get a, uh, getting a kind of political asylum and I able to continue my study. And then there's, again, I have to pass through another dis displaced person life, asylum seeker. And then, and, and then uh, later on, I got a um, uh, uh, chance as a journalist in the BBC. So throughout my BBC career, I've been uh, reporting on a Burma issue, especially because of political issues. And then uh, that political issue is actually the main reason for the, the refugees fleeing the country. So my job again is uh, covering the refugee issue. I, I cover child soldier issues. I cover so some sort of uh, girls from a refugee camps exploited uh, and then uh, working as a slave labor or prostitute in a neighbor, neighboring Thailand. So such a things are uh, again, then I, uh, I went, um, uh, after 10 years with the BBC, I went back to the Thailand Burma border and then ran a kind of, a, uh, uh, with the Internews, International Media Development Organization, I ran a journalism school. And then uh, at there, I trained a few refugees in the 
and I set up the help set up the radio internet FM radio stations in the refugee camps, working with some sort of a young uh, uh, youth in the refugee camps. So such a kind of experience, uh, really, I'm witnessing that uh, uh, the real refugee lives over there. Then and we have a Rohingya issue. There's an emergency. So this emergency, I have to cover why I'm, I'm working as a VOA uh, journalist in the BBC. And after I came back and uh, I arrived in the VOA as a chief, I have to manage uh, all the reportings on the uh, uh, Rohingya refugee camps in the Bangladesh and Burma border. So these are the, my kind of uh, the life experience and the, the, which is related to, to, to me and personally and then my work. So I remind you that, that Burma is actually is a, uh, fifth largest refugee, uh, what I call producing country, so called as a source of the refugees, you know, along with uh, uh, Syria, uh, Congo, and then uh, South Sudan, and of course Venezuela. So later on, and of course the Syria surplus. This is where, where I uh, leave it. And like uh, Heather, Heather, where has an experience in the, the Middle East and Africa, but um, I have more my experience in the Southeast Asia, Burma, Malaysia, and Bangladesh, where most of the, a lot of refugees are there. So uh, this is my brief introduction. This is a little bit longer than what I expected. And so thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Lorraine. So just to, to moving along uh, quickly, there's um, a lot of reasons why reporting on refugees is important, but there's three main reasons, not necessarily the most important reasons, but three I want to point out. One, just the sheer number of people. There is 100,000, at least, this is just a, an estimate by the UN, forcibly displaced people, which includes refugees, uh, uh, internally displaced people, stateless people um, in the world, which is uh, about the 15th largest country in the world, if there were a country. Um, and Another important reason is that these people, this group of people, which is larger than most countries in the world, is extremely vulnerable and not protected by any government. They have protection by UN organizations, but these groups are only responsible for some of them and they're still organizations, not governments. Um, and then the third is just simply information. As journalists, we can get some of the best information about some of the most important events in the world the, the best way to get it is from people fleeing the event. So like if there's a war and you wanna know what happened inside, you can ask a soldier, you can ask an NGO or an investigator or an analyst or a government. And if they know anything, they learned it from people fleeing. And so our best source is refugees. I mean, as journalists, it, our families, um, ordinary people who fled the conflict. Um, so, uh, there are some important topics that often get overlooked within refugee crises, and I'll let Lewin talk a little bit about some of these. There are many, but there are a few specific ones we'd like to point out. Yeah, thanks, Heather. You know, I'd like to emphasize that, that uh, the uh, one thing why refugees reporting is important. Yes, of course, you know, a lot of people interested in a refugee issue, especially in the kind of emergency political crisis or huge uh, climatic uh, issues, some like uh, 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 the, the drought and uh, something like that. When there is a kind of, a, uh, it is in the news and then mainly talking at the time about the uh, sheer number of the people fleeing from the, uh, seeking for their safety or looking, for, uh, fleeing for their own place for their food insecurity or something like that. But later on, as we know that uh, news move on, there's a development. And then events after event, dramatic events after dramatic uh, events. And so, uh, so most uh, many at times, you know, that a refugee issue being uh, sometimes uh, uh, forgotten. So, and also uh, why we are talking about the refugees issue, a lot of people tend to look at that, uh, the basic, uh, what about why it is, or the real cause, like what a political crisis or famine or something like that. And then uh, after all, there's a, uh, 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 and also how the AIDS organizations are working, how these uh, number of the peoples are suddenly arrived and then uh, uh, living in their camps or something like that. But uh, later on, uh, when times go on, uh, there's uh, refugees, they don't disappear themselves. 
they get uh, uh, because of that. Of course, you know, when they are uh, fleeing from their own place, they are taking refuge for their safety. But of course, safety is that uh, very what I call uh, fundamental issue on uh, which is uh, uh, very uh, appropriately uh, at the focus of this year World Refugee Day, so a right to seek the safety. So uh, of course, safety is a fundamental issue, but. After safety, safety safely arrive in the refugee camps or something like that. So, uh, what is the uh, uh, real solution for? Or what is their future after all? So, we know that you know the refugees want to go back home. Of course, everybody wants to go back home. So, there may be a kind of uh, volunteer repatriations if it is a country uh, political situation or whether uh, climatic situations is getting better or they can go back. But not all the time things uh, happen that quickly and then also they don't have the chance. Now, or another thing is that they, they integrated into the host country. And then uh, there's, there's a question about that. Is host countries actually uh, welcoming these refugees or allow to uh, disintegrate or uh, assimilate uh, their communities uh, in the, the huge populations or something like that. What is the nationality laws? Another one is a settlement, uh, such as like me or not the somewhere third country, but not those things are happening like that. So the, we have a term called warehousing problem. So many of the refugees are, or more than 70% of the raw refugee refu population is a stay in the kind of uh, uh, camp restricted uh, uh, their mobility to and commands for more than 80 to 20 years. So their problem and the future of these uh, people has to be looked into that and a report. That's a constant reminder of the human tragedies, not only in the emergency, but also on that they are about their futures and about that other uh, 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 part of the war in the area that affect by that situation. So uh, this is an issue I'd like to uh, emphasize why we are our refugees reporting is important. Okay, um, thank you. And so I'm just gonna add a little bit about that's you know what's important, but um, about working in refugee camps. I mean, you can find refugees in all sorts of other people, uh, in all sorts of other places um, in town, cities, you know, they're just like, any people, they can be anywhere, but you will find a lot of people who have fled, um, fled their homes in camps, sometimes with tents, sometimes in cities like in Beirut, sometimes in makeshift buildings. Um, a lot of the times when reporters get to these places and find they are calm and well run, which is not always true, but when they are, they'll see a, not much is happening. And sometimes I'll hear people say, this is boring and there's no story here, but this is never true. Every single person you meet in a refugee camp must have an incredible death-defying story. They would definitely not live there if they did not see something extraordinary. Um, and one trick is if you don't know anything about the person you talk to, you know, after you introduce yourself and get your name, their name and maybe ask a couple of questions about the job, you can start to dig in by asking about the very day they fled. This is a question that often works to uh, break the ice because it's, it's a story people have often told before. It's usually an extraordinary story, and it's something that they may be comfortable relaying a lot of details to get started. Um, and some, so this kind of interview that I'm talking about, once you get started, uh, can go on for a while. And refugee camps or um, other places where refugees can be can be a really good place to do long interviews. Um, often they are far enough away from the danger people fled to. Um, to, so people are more relaxed. And there's often a lot of time to, people have time. There's often not much to do. Um, but one thing about reporting in this area is, which I think I'm gonna be really brief because it's really obvious, uh, I think to most of you, but you do have to always keep in your mind and also make sure you keep in your colleagues' minds that when you're visiting somebody in a tent or a makeshift home, it is their home. So, so occasionally I'll see people that will forget that they're walking into someone's home. So, you know, just the normal things you would do, take off your shoes if the host takes off their shoes. So, I mean, you get the point. There's a lot of little things like that, but it is something to be aware of for you and people around you. Um, so, uh, Lewin mentioned before that there's, there's also um, an issue in when you're reporting on refugees that is often neglected um, about host, uh, host countries, refugees 
um, whether they are welcome or unwelcome in the country they live in, um, are not always welcome within the community. Um, so I'll let Lewin talk a little bit about the reaction of host countries, specifically in his experience, there have been some dramatic uh, reactions. Yeah, thanks, Heather. It's a very good idea, especially when you meet a refugees and interview, maybe as an icebreaker and you ask about the day they flee home. Of course, yeah, there's a lot of stories they have to tell. There's a lot of, uh, from there, we can just simply guess that how much of the brutalities and how much of the, uh, what I call, uh, discriminations or uh, this, uh, an imaginable uh, situation they have been faced, you know. So by that, by that, you know, we can understand that uh, uh, what is actually personal or uh, kind of uh, these uh, uh, what I call safety and security. Uh, uh, I myself, of course, that I experienced these brutalities and violence and you know, uh, what I call violated by the armed forces and had to be. I we a lot of like a lot of other people. We I saw that uh, uh, people be uh, beside me and uh, next to me uh, being shot at and uh, a few learn a lot of my former co colleagues and uh, sentenced to the life imprisonment and uh, why I escaped. I saw that uh, I I have my friends and uh, serving the uh, twenty year imprisonment in a uh, in, in back home and then a lot of. Uh, uh, the people uh, were killed or something like that. So that's a fascinating story we have it. Not only in that, uh, there's a lot of course about uh, the nature of the ethnic based uh, discriminations and uh, also, also about the uh, racial discrimination and, and kind of, a, especially the emergency like a Rohingya uh, refugee issue. It is based on that, uh, what I call religious, uh, Based uh, discriminations and uh, they become they and uh, they are not uh, uh, recognized as, as, as citizens only because of their ethnicities. The state that uh, uh, being a life of a stateless person, we learn a lot and uh, we know that. And after after they arrive, as uh, uh, the first uh, qu question by the uh, Heather to continue on about uh, uh, the situation of the host country. Of course, they arrive into the nearby, mostly a nearby border area between two countries. Uh, hopefully, a more friendly host country who would be willing to accept these, uh, or at least temporary for those refugees or kind of the displaced person. But uh, the thing is, there's a lot of limitations for the host countries. So uh, I will tell you only about that my very, very recent, uh, uh, what I call experience. Actually, it was said back in 2019, I visited uh, uh, refugee camps in the Thailand, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Burma border, and where nearly 1 million Rohingya Muslim re refugees were uh, taking uh, refuge over there. And then, and then the thing is, uh, why I, I especially look at that, uh, kind of uh, attitude of the uh, home country and then locals. And then the uh, first thing I look at is uh, local television reportings and newspaper reporting about the situation. So the place they arrived in, this is a kind of place called very beautiful place. So called Causes Bazaar, where there's a huge and the longest beach and beautiful beach in the Southeast Asia. Uh, they, they boost in a uh, uh, Bangladesh boost. So most of the, this is a kind of a leisure area for the uh, Bangladesh. And then they try to develop as an international tourist, tourist attraction. But unfortunately the refugee crisis happened and then a, new, uh, a lot of refugees from a neighboring country arrive and then they live in the makeshift camp nearby and uh, that become a kind of anxiety. And I saw in a newspaper, local newspaper in a Bangladesh newspaper saying, uh, referring refugee as a kind of rubbish, destroying our en environment, and wanted person to push them back to, uh, to their own country or something like that. At the same time, you know, that uh, host country, because of the, the ideal situation is so allow those refugees to be integrated with the locals, but the Bangladesh authorities, they do not. So for example, like a VOA has tried to what I call broadcast a radio program for the refugees over there, but authorities are very much unwilling to allow us, mainly because of they don't want their refugees to become a long standing or, or to be there for permanently. Main thing is that they want uh, the refugees to be go back home or uh, move to somewhere else. 
So that kind of uh, situations uh, 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 we have to be aware of, and uh, we are we we are just also when reporting the refugee issues. These things should be uh, looked at into it. And then uh, apart from the previous issue I mentioned about, uh, uh, I witnessed a few uh, uh, girls, young women uh, being uh, what I call human traffic, uh, traffic data to, to become a prostitute. And not only in Thailand, Bangladesh, I spoke with the one of that uh, person who uh, actually uh, reported to me with the pictures, the these uh, refugees girls being uh, trafficked to nearby Tao and Dhaka and even on, on to that uh, Middle East country, rich country. So that kind of situations, uh, uh, we have to look at it. So uh, Heather, uh, this is the brief situation about the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, attitude or of the host country because they the, those are host country they have their own nation and laws and then uh, they have a uh, most of them are not very wealthy country anywhere in the regions uh, they, so they don't have a much of a resource to uh, provide and also they have uh, their own uh, problem right? like like uh, for example like uh, bangladesh they are they are islamic country but uh, they don't want these refugees to be there and then uh, to be a ground of the uh, what i call recruiting ground for the islamic uh, what i call extremists or something like that, and then drug trafficking or something like that. So they are, they are not very much welcoming. And also they limited access for uh, uh, international aid organizations. So that, that make refugee life more miserable, actually. So they start uh, feeling crowded situation and a futureless and then that sort of a desperations that they are that they've been suffering from. Uh, we lost your voice. Sure. Uh, On mute. Hi. So this is I, I. What you're saying is very true. And the people often find refugee camps are placed in the least desirable part of the country, far away from anything. Um, often, as you said, it's often the host community is often poor itself. So um, in Sudan, when the Ethiopian uh, at the Tigray crisis in 2020, when people fled to Sudan. The camps there are all in border areas, really far from many cities. Um, and the communities did do a lot to help the, the people, the Ethiopian people coming across. But you could also, not very long after, you could also hear the strain from, from host families and hear racism and hear, you know, problems uh, arising. And it's not necessarily always badly intentioned, but it does create tensions. Um, the next topic I wanted to talk about, which it sounds academic, but it's really not, it is uh, language and narratives. Um, language surrounding refugees um, is used as a weapon sometimes by governments or um, enemies of displaced people for whatever reason. Um, so, and it's also used by NGOs to serve their own purposes. Um, so our goal is to try to use the language accurately and also uh, neutrally. Um, there's a, uh, a, a toolkit, a tip kit that, that the ICFJ sent out um, online that we can find after um, that talks a bit about this. And um, uh, I'm gonna just quickly like give some details about what it's about, um, but they give some good details about how to deal with it in terms of in the writing. Um, so the dictionary definition of a refugee is simply a person who has been forced to leave their country in order to escape war, persecution, or natural disaster. So tens of thousands of refugees fled their homes. That's the definition. However, the United Nations has a legal definition. Um, you can find the legal definition and all of the details um, in the United Nations Refugee Conventions and following protocols, sorry, the convention and protocols. Um, it's not a lot of documents, it's not that complex, but it is important to know the legal definition and the dictionary definition are not the same. Um, the other word, and the word that is often used as a weapon, is the word migrant. Um, so the UN will say, it says, actually, I'll just read this. Migrant is, while there is no formal legal definition of an international migrant, most experts agree that an international migrant is someone who changes his or her country of usual residence without, irrespective of the reason for migration or legal status. Um, UN officials will be quick to tell you um, that usually a migrant 
move because of uh, uh, because they want a better life, a better job. Now, this is uh, super important to put some context in it because when you meet so-called migrants in the field, you'll meet people that, yes, they might have moved. I mean, they might fit the UN's definition. It's not a legal definition of migrant. They have moved, might have moved to get a better job, but that does not mean that they had a choice. Like if you meet someone um, from, uh, for example, from the Niger Delta in Nigeria, this is a place you meet people sometimes in Europe that they fled across the Sahara Desert uh, all the way through the Southern Libya, which is a place where there's a lot of kidnapping, rape, ransom. It's extremely dangerous. They survived that, get to, to uh, one of the sea towns or Tripoli and managed to survive to cross the street sea into Europe while so many people die along the way. They survived all of this horrible journey. They didn't do it just because they didn't like, like their job at the ice cream shop. They did it because they needed to move to survive. Um, one other reason why these words are important is that they're used actively in the news by governments. So for example, um, not many people recently have been arguing with this sentence. As Russia surrounded Kyiv, thousands of Ukrainians fled the city. Ukrainian refugees, sorry. Thousands of Ukrainian refugees fled the city. Um, now, other governments at the same time, sometimes on the same day in the same newspaper, would dispute uh, this one. As the Taliban took over Kabul, thousands of Afghan refugees fled the city. Um, the UN could tell you that legally, neither of these are true because they're not officially refugees until they're designated refugees. Um, but common sense and the dis dictionary definition tells us that people fleeing the Taliban in Afghanistan and people fleeing the Russian army in Ukraine are refugees um, and they can be referred to as such. Um, sorry, I just got a little carried away here. Um, so there's also certain narratives that we should that I try to be aware of and try to either if they're false or misleading, keep out of my stories. And if they're said to me um, by authorities, try to follow up to get more information. So um, we talked about the, the, the migrant narrative, refugees travel for a better, better life. Um, then, but there's other narratives to be aware of, like for example, voluntary repatriation. Um, there's, uh, sometimes you'll hear that this happened and a lot of people went home and they went home by choice. This is not usually such a clear cut thing that happened if you talk to the people that actually went home. Um, it does happen that people do choose to go home. They give up, they're not gonna get refugee status wherever they are and they want to go back. But most of the time in my experience, when you hear a voluntary repatriation, the people don't really have much of a choice. They're not necessarily forced by, on, by gunpoint, although that does happen. Um, and so good to follow up on anything like that. You hear about it, ask the people that experienced it and you will often find a different answer than what you were told. Um, so uh, Gwen, I was just wondering, uh, is there any other false narratives that you would like us to think about and be aware of yeah, um, well, I, totally, yeah I totally agree on these, uh, what I call, language issue, because of the, some of those language uh, sometimes used and are, are uh, accompanied with a kind of a stigma. For, so the thing is, like, um, now I noticed that uh, even for the war refugee days, you know, uh, there's a, uh, a carefully using something about, or the, for those people who are forcefully, forcefully displaced around the world, so um, even for that definition, you know, about uh, one million, uh, one hundred million people uh, who are forcibly, forcibly uh, displaced around the world. So uh, even under the, this uh, uh, what I call expressions, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, those people mandated and protected by the UNACR or ANWA, UNOWA, uh, is uh, only about uh, constitute only about thirty millions. So the rest, for example, like if seventy millions is a uh, internally displaced person, or sometimes something like a, a asylum seeker in a th uh, other countries, or uh, that's kind of a, a different, a different things. But uh, sadly, what uh, one comes to the issue about a refugee, for example, the namesake, uh, 
because of the, especially in the uh, economic downturn in a host country, either in a first, second country host country or third resettlement country, uh, especially for the economic depression or some kind of problem uh, situation, they are just simply uh, what I call uh, accused as a kind of okay, the uh, a pointed finger to the, at them, and then uh, uh, they are not uh, preferably treated very well. So uh, a lot of discriminations uh, against the refugees and uh, things and you see that in Europe and then uh, even in America, you can see that as a kind of such a thing happening. So that refugee name itself in that sense is uh, kind of uh, uh, carrying the stigma for those refugee as well. At the same time, you no, know, there's a mistaken uh, word, refugee and migrant. Some people say that uh, it's, uh, all the refugees are looking for the best, better place to lift them instead of uh, properly understanding that, that they are actually people seeking the safety. So nobody, to, with my experience, and I know that I met a lot of, uh, several thousands of refugees, uh, majority you know, the, uh, of them, all of them, they love home. Their main reason is to go back to their home because of they are just simply uh, came, uh, came out because of the brutality they experienced, because of the war, because of the violation, their rights being violated, and because of that. Uh, think about it. When there's a kind of a, uh, people or villages uh, caught up in the uh, warring situation, uh, they cannot uh, uh, call, grow uh, uh, food and uh, things. They have uh, they don't have uh, uh, livelihoods at all, and they don't have a food. And so they have to move on, move to somewhere they can find food or somewhere they will not be being killed. And at the same time, there's a lot of tactics, right? That uh, kind of a. Uh, uh, the brutal military forces, and uh, especially, I will tell you about the Burma. For example, like the Burmese forces, when they are dealing with that uh, uh, rebels group, they are just simply uh, practicing what they call it a uh, full cut strategy or something like that. So this is what they call it. It is uh, uh, intentionally what they do is uh, uh, cutting the intelligence to the opponent, other other recruit food, and then a kind of. Uh, uh, these uh, the, the, the funding. So that means that uh, the the militaries and these uh, the troops never don't want to uh, villager to stay their own place because they are worried that these villagers are source of information about the troop movements or providing food to the rebels or uh, kind of supporting fan or uh, that's a lot of or recruitment. So they they just simply kick them out and uh, force them out. They burn the villages and then they kill the uh, villages. So they they scare, scare a lot of scaring daddy. So only because of that. But uh, most of the refugees I know that encounter is uh, they want to go back home when there's a situation is resolved or stable or well or uh, what I call good enough for, for them to go back. But uh, only after the living, they have experience with that uh, uh, encampment situations in the uh, for few years, they start thinking about their futures for themselves, for themselves or their children, for their education, for their uh, better life. So that time they might be thinking about the better life. So uh, refugees moving out or settle in a somewhere for the better life. I, I don't say that it is not true, but there's a situation, there's a story behind that. It, of course, I cannot, I will not refuse, re, refuse that. You know? Okay, these refugees are uh, set up here in America for a better life. True, yes, but there's a story behind that. We need to know that. We need to present these set of things as a reporter for those the public to understand and then just simply sympathetic and then uh, be a bit more supportive uh, to that uh, war situation. Um, I think. What you're saying is very true, and um, uh, you know, every refugee, every person, displaced person I've met in 12 years in the field, as actually not everyone, but almost everyone, does want to go home and does long to go home. But I, I so want I to go home. High level I want NGO. to go home. When I fled, when I fled Burma, <laughs> I want to go home. My ultimate, uh, what I call, uh, thing is, of course, I've I, I fled. I, I, I was three or four of my life. And then um, definitely, if I don't, I don't flee that I will be arrested or be killed. So I escape. My, my, but my ultimate intention is to go back home. 
But unfortunately, um, but I'm a fortunate, uh, most fortunate uh, displaced person among the refugee families. I have a chance uh, to go out uh, to the other country, uh, continue the studies, and uh, to become what I become now. But uh, I, anyhow, anyway, after that, I have a chance to go back home only 23 years after that, uh, of the yeah. day I had. So, uh, but I, I, how I felt at the day when I had go home is uh, indescribable. You know, when I touch down from the planes and I go back home. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I, I emphasize all those people, refugees or whatever, uh, they, uh, people, they want to go home. Sure, yes. Um, one thing to be careful of though is, is or I guess just in terms of our advice as journalists is to keep what he's saying in mind. Because I've heard uh, high level officials, um, uh, very high level officials say that same thing without finishing the sentence. So I interviewed a guy, in Geneva who said, every refugee I've ever met wants to go home, as he said. And, but he didn't finish the sentence because every refugee he's ever met does did say they want to go home. But they also said, that if it was safe, if effect. I could go home, if I could feed my children, if I wouldn't go to jail, if I would live. Um, so yeah, so you have, that's one of, as another important narrative. We use the word, go home with the dignity. Dignifying yes. home, going home. So, and now also, this is a bang of a, uh, the, uh, the ultimate, uh, what I call, uh, solutions of the refugee issue anyway. Uh, if, the, the, if the political situations and the situation in the back home is uh, kind of favorable, and then there's a dignifying way to go back home or something like that. Most of the refugees, they volunteer themselves to go home anyway. So this is a main, what I call, uh, reason for those uh, international aid organizations and uh, UN Asia as a kind of first priority. They encourage and uh, resolve the situation back home and then uh, make it for all those uh, situations favorable for the refugees to go back home. Because there's other situation as I described, like uh, uh, integration with the host country is uh, too, very much you know, kind of uh, impossible. But too much on the against the national law and then a lot of culture things or something like that and also about uh, the third, uh, resettlement in the third country how many people there's a kind of a, a norm a very fractions of the population of the rural refugees have a chance to resettle in that uh, third country so uh, this is a little bit of a uh, kind of ongoing situation. Of course, we have we are seeing that uh, uh, refugees and volunteer repatriation with their digni dignity is a, a kind of a favorable outcome. But since that never happened, so we have a problem, as I mentioned, about the warehousing situations coming. So this is a situation I like to say that. Thanks very much for that uh, uh, reminder or the, to make a kind of a, a statement. All the refugees are not uh, all want to go home or something like that. But we are not definitely, uh, nobody should uh, force them to go back home anyway. Right, that is true. So um, for the remainder of the time, we have two things. One, we have some, some and maybe Paul, you can jump in with uh, how you'd like to do this. We've got a couple of, scenarios that we would like to put to the to everybody um, to tell you know to maybe discuss how they would deal with this issue um, and we also have some time to take questions so if it's okay with you Paul perhaps we'll we'll put forward a couple of scenarios and then take questions does that work or do you want to go to the questions first yeah looking at the time we already have like five questions for you Okay, so you want to start with questions, and then if uh, we don't get to these scenarios, I'll just post them. Yes, I think um, I think it's better if we go to the questions. So what I've been is, uh, thank you very much uh, for those insights that you've shared. I think um, I have the questions on your screen. Um, so the first question um, comes in from Alison. Alison would like to know the first question is uh, what are the key legal issues that journalists need to get clear um, with before reporting on refugees. And uh, the second question is, I understand journalists' exposure to some traumatic scenes, but how do you journalists often navigate uh, through your work? So those are the two questions. Um, so do you want to go? Um, sure, well, I'll start with the first one and maybe Luen, you want to take the second one? Does that work? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Sure. Okay, so legal issues that journalists need to understand before reporting on refugees, besides understanding uh, 
what refugees are legally and uh, having this background it's not it's not so terribly complicated but you need to understand it so you don't confuse um uh, legal jargon that you'll get a lot from NGOs with just the facts on the ground. Um, you also need to know the legal status of the specific refugee crisis that you are covering, and it can vary greatly. Like, for example, um, uh, there are camps that, that are actually essentially detention centers, and often these people don't have any refugee, legal refugee status. Um, and so people will uh, be talking about their rights but you should know what their actual legal rights are as per the international law. And if possible, as per the country they're in um, before reporting on them. Or, or you should also know what are their legal rights um, as per international law. So you can actually be a watchdog, be the, you know, the fourth estate to see if they're actually being granted their rights. I mean, there's a huge amount of cases nowadays of people being pushed back out across borders without getting the chance to claim asylum, which is their legal right. Um, and this happens all the time. And this is just one example of the rights of refugees, the rights of families fleeing conflict being violated. So being aware of those rights, you can report on when they're violated. Um, uh, Luin, if you wanna talk a little bit more about that or about uh, the second question, that'd be great. Yeah, that's uh, based on my experience. You know, whenever we try to enter, uh, with, uh, th throughout my careers and you know, all reporting on the different issues. Uh, I visited uh, refugee camps in the Thailand Burma border and the Bangladesh Rohingya camps. Most difficult thing is that you have access to into the refugee camps. So there's uh, mainly because uh, as I mentioned that our host countries, uh, uh, they don't want uh, refugees to uh, move uh, free, rooming around freely. So the camps are uh, uh, tightly controlled, access are tightly controlled, and then a, a little bit of a difficult uh, to get access into there. And then, uh, uh, so that's a one of the uh, issue with the protocol. In that sense, it is a really well set up refugee camp even. But the most uh, dangerous issue I like to add is, uh, okay, we are talking about uh, uh, well set up refugee camps on the border as a, of this site. But what about uh, access to the, IDPs, internally displaced person, because they are the same people as the forcefully uh, displaced uh, for reasons. So they are uh, they are trapped trapped in a, uh, in the other side of the border. So to go and get uh, information from them or to report on them is you need to take your own risks because of that. You you cross the international border where you are not very much welcome at all in that sense. There's a landmine. There's a lot of uh, other uh, side of the security force uh, who might be uh, accuse you of uh, spying or uh, aiding their enemies or something like that, whatever. And then also other disease and uh, a lot of issues. So uh, to reach out to these uh, uh, internally displaced persons are more difficult. It, it is uh, somehow uh, to go and report and uh, legally is impossible sometimes. But, it only because of its illegal practice or to go inside there and report or get information from them. No, we have to do some time. We need to take our own risk in that, in that sense. So we have to use a lot of locals and a lot of uh, uh, what about friendly organization to help us to go to, to have access and in information and uh, just simply to report on their, their, their dire situations, their story as well. So about the trauma, of course, you know, journalists, you know, whenever you go and report, you know, uh, I, I, I'm really sure that uh, Heather, you have a lot of uh, experience in a most gruesome situation and why you report in the Middle East and then uh, Syria and Africa. At the same, th same time, you know, as myself, as a displaced person at the border and also while reporting in the refugee, uh, Rohingya refugee camps, I saw a lot of uh, what I call people who told their uh, kind of uh, unbelievable brutal stories, you know, and also met uh, uh, former victims of uh, uh, human trafficking, girls who've been, uh, uh, what about rape, or the girl who've been uh, uh, sell as a prostitute and uh, uh, rescued or something like that. So for them, you know, that, that after hearing their story, you know, that these stories, you know, resounding in our eyes, and you know, know, sometimes, you know, I don't know how much of the trauma is remaining there, but um, uh, there's a certainly there's a lot of uh, traumatic experience and uh, 
visiting these uh, situations and reporting on, uh, let alone uh, uh, about uh, those, of course, sometimes very violent situation about uh, you see some sort of amputees and a uh, freshly wounded person fleeing from the battle or something like that. Luckily, I don't experience uh, in my later life, you know, like that. But uh, while I was in a student's uh, resistance force uh, working with the refugee camps, I met a lot of those uh, uh, landmine victims, uh, fresh, and then a few people is dying just in front of me. And, uh, and sometimes it's remained in my, uh, what I call, uh, thinking or something like that. So I don't know. Sometimes I know what, uh, after the retirement life or something like that, if I like to do this uh, peacefully, I have to go for the uh, counseling or something like that about those issues. But very important for uh, uh, reporters to be prepared about uh, what kind of situation you will encounter, what kind of story you will be uh, hearing, and then uh, you have a lot of emotionally, what I call, affected um, uh, situation you will be definitely encounter. Okay, um, thank you very much. So we have more questions. Uh, the next question is this, um, I think this is regarding um, the VOA's uh, refugee coverage. So I want to know the efforts of the organization in trying to report refugees and communities in Nigeria. Um, can you do um, please? Definitely, Heather. <laughs> okay, so I actually left Nigeria in 2014 after being there for two and a half years. Um, there is, Voice of America has a large presence in Nigeria and I can't speak for the Nigerian audience to say if we're doing a good job or a bad job, but I know we're doing a lot of stuff. Um, in the English language service, we have, a, pretty sure still now, but we almost always have a full-time reporter in Abuja. Um, and I was th that was me for, for when I was there. Um, there's also quite a few Hausa language reporters and um, they are very active and also well listened to. Um, we don't, uh, we don't, there, there's, as you know, there's a lot of languages spoken in Nigeria. And I do feel like we are, we, the one thing we are lacking in Nigeria is a more larger variety of language. Um, so I think if you, if you are Nigerian and you, and you are interested in wondering about, uh, interested in VOA coverage, um, that's something that I would like to see more of. And I'd love our audience to tell VOA, we want more of that um, because we do report in almost 50 languages. So why not Yoruba? Like you should. Um, anyway, you can see our Nigeria coverage online in Hausa or in English. And uh, also uh, we appear regularly on Channels TV. I don't know, Paul, do you watch Channels TV? Yes. When I lived in Nigeria, I used to watch it all the time. In fact, I bought a TV just to watch Channels. Um, so we do that. We work closely with Channels TV as well and provide uh, news packages and appear live on their shows uh, from time to time from all over the world. Yeah, and, uh, apart from uh, Nigeria, as you know, that uh, as far as I remember, please correct me, uh, that uh, knowing that the reporting on refugee is very important. And also, it should be a kind of uh, not only about the crisis reporting or not only about uh, kind of a reporting for the emergency situation. VOA realized that and, uh, we have uh, started that uh, refugee, uh, what I call reporting uh, uh, department. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, back in uh, 2017. I, I believe that you know we 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 start uh, uh, dedicated uh, a group of journalists and a bureau for uh, especially for refugees and uh, so we also in, in that sense you know VOA have uh, extended uh, refugee uh, reporting uh, what I call department for uh, opening that uh, Rohingya lifeline programs so daily. Uh, 15 minutes uh, radio program, or, uh, and also we have a dedicated uh, website and then a lot of uh, refugee oriented uh, or refugee issues reporting. So the main issue, I believe it is, uh, as I said that, not only about the crisis or emergency situation, but consistent reporting on that uh, situations and uh, uh, health finding for the proper solution for that uh, very, very important issue. So. That's a, my uh, what I call supplement to the what I know about that. Then. So that's a re refugee reporting is very big and a very important for the VOA Voice of America. I, yeah. I do think I do think oh. they just add one more thing about Nigeria specifically. That one thing we're missing a bit of, and I don't mean just VOA. I mean the media as a whole is in northern Nigeria, northeastern Nigeria. There's a lot of displaced families, um, and a lot of them come further south into Abuja, but into the cities, but a lot of this displacement crisis is 
undercovered by the media, partially because it's difficult to access, but it's partially just undercovered and that should change. Yeah. Okay, yes. So we have on the line Amini Kakule, I think uh, he's joining us from Congo. Um, oh, hi. Have a mic. Hello, can you talk? Can you unmute yourself, Amini? You have your hand raised. I think we'll come back to Amini. Oh, there he is. Yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. That's okay. okay. Can you can, can you hear? Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I was a little bit late. Okay. And um, it's just hello. 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 Okay. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, my question was actually uh, when reporting the refugee camp, like when we just eat just in the refugee camp, we have to have uh, accreditation from UNSCR so that we can be allowed to go and uh, make a report just in the camp. Uh, for me, um, I feel like uh, it's not like a freedom of speech that uh, journalists are granted, but why should we have accreditation? Whereas simply when we are known as a journalist, you have to go and make your story without uh, going here and then to get some accreditation. So for me, I feel like they're just harboring this freedom of speech. So I don't know how uh, really with, uh, when reporting with refugees, if really uh, freedom of uh, speech or let's say, um, uh, let's say accreditation really are allowed when you want to make a story uh, in refugee camp and so forth. Thank you. I think you're absolutely right. Like the UNHCR, when they try to accredit you to go into a camp, I mean, yeah, you have to follow their rules if they control the camp and they control the doors because you have to get in the door somehow. But I agree. Like it, it, it they depends on the camp, depends on the country, and it depends on the day sometimes. But yes, organizations do try to control speech, try to control what refugees can say or not say, and they often use accreditation as a tool to control what we are reporting. Um, and it's wrong. And I, that's another thing we should be reporting on. There's a lot of gatekeeping, so and, uh, bureaucratic gatekeeping, especially by the, the local authorities, no, and not only with the UNACR, or, and also local authority, authorities who is uh, in charge or running the camps. So but basically, I think that, uh, of course, and when the, you go through the, the, the bureaucratic procedure, you will be very much likely accompanied by those uh, authorities and then uh, kind of uh, they are camp agents or something like that. Very, uh, my uh, experience, and you know, whenever I go in there, you know, then I might make a kind of separate trip to, to, to go have a kind of contact with that, uh, a lot of local refugees themselves or some other like, kind of a non-government uh, international organization, which are actually very, very uh, doing the background work over there and then get a lot of, you need to know that a lot of stories beforehand and to go inside and then to talk with the real people over there. Of course, you need at some areas and very tight security you need to have your bureaucratic kind of uh, permissions but there's a lot of issues you have to go through that's uh, my experience okay lots of questions lots of people want to talk so i will give the mic next to beatrice beatrice hello i'm um, beatrice i'm from kaduna nigeria yes. okay and earlier Hila was saying that um, some of the stories in nigeria especially in the northeast northwest is undercover so how do we report those stories and we don't get into trouble? Um, I think one, like, uh, thank you Beatrice first, by the way. And um, I think one uh, sort of trick, at least this is just a start, we can, somebody else can add more, but in terms of reporting what's going in Northeast, going on in Northeast North, uh, Northwest Nigeria and issues that are quite sensitive and you're afraid that you will get punished um, for reporting them. Sometimes a way around it is to keep it to personal stories, like not reporting, not making a report about what the government's doing, about what Boko Haram's doing, but making about what this particular family went through. Your readers will know 
you know, that the, yeah. you know, whatever they went through, they will, you know, I assume it's going to be something that is difficult and hard or maybe horrible. Otherwise, I'm not sure. like, like I would assume that would be the topic and they will know the situation that brought them to it. So that's one way. Um, another thing to think about though, is that a lot of stories are dangerous to do. And if you are living inside the conflict and inside the area where you are subject to be um, in danger from doing your story, you have to think carefully about when to do that story or if to do that story, or if you can pass it on to somebody because you're not going to be able to be a great reporter if you're in jail or you're dead. Like you have to, you have to mitigate what you're reporting sometimes in order to just to stay alive sometimes. Yeah, so that's just one trick. I'm sure there's lots of others. I mean, we all think about this every day. How do we report this and also get out alive and not in jail? So it's a really difficult, tricky thing that you have to deal with all the time. That's and I think we, we are, Chido Zia, are you ready, Ibrahim? We have Chido Zia and Ibrahim. Yes, I'm ready, thank you. So let's go back to hey. Bas. Um, okay, sorry. But first of all, do you guys like hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. So, uh, my name is Ibrahim Ali, and uh, I'm Syrian, living in Turkey, and I I've been actually like cooperating with outlet media, like I don't know, like probably ten years so far from the uprising since the start of the uprising. So, uh, since we were talking about like actually passing the story to someone else and trying to not put yourself in risk and I'm here gonna like actually evolve in about the, a situation where I did the same. But what happened that when I was like directly in a problem, I didn't have any evidence that I was doing that. And that was like actually a major case which actually expanded in, in some point in, in the last couple of years for too many journalists or too many citizen journalists from the Syrians specifically in Turkey, where they didn't even have like a way to even prove that they were actually active in actually reporting about refugees or the conflict of refugees in Turkey. And at the same time, didn't even have like a way to change the, their situation when they were like in the like red priority risk. So in, in this case, what do you guys first like actually suggest for us to do? Uh, another major problem that we have is that I, I think some of you guys like know that we have what we call it now the alternative media, which is actually some of the Syrian community who's actually have their own news media and they're trying to, to report about the Syrians. But the funny part is that they are registered in Turkey. So basically because of the restrictions and what they have about the fears of like actually losing the uh, registration and all the other stuff, they're trying to pass all those conflicts about the Syrian and not even report about it. So as Syrians trying to report about it, we, we don't have any platform to do it, but we try to jump to foreign media, trying to do some pitching about it. And then we, you know, stuck in a wall where we have our second language. It's not like that we're so perfect in doing it. We're trying, but most of the time we fail. So mm -hmm. I don't know what, what we have to do about those two situations. We try to look a lot uh, in the African, like actually experience about it. It's a little bit different here. so. We don't know what to do. We need your suggestion. Thank you. Thank you for that quick. Thank you very much. So, um, well, I live in Turkey too, and it is really tricky here. I mean, there's no, there's no simple answer to the question, Abraham, but the, I mean, I guess I just one question. Are you talking about alternative media, like local Turkish media that's spreading pop propaganda against Syrian refugees. I've seen a little. No, bit no, no, no. I'm, I'm talking something. specifically about the Syrian media. We call it alternative media, which media. actually, yeah. Um, we have two types of Syrian media. We have like pro regime media, and we have alternative media, which is actually pro revolution and pro like democratic. And mm -hmm. those guys actually always have those the fear that we might lose like the registration, the department, and like because most of them based in Turkey, so they pass or like trying to take like a actually a blind eye about some situations where they think that if we report it, we would get stuck. And yeah. personally- I know, you know some people in this situation yeah. as well. Yeah, um, true. So yeah, th that's what I meant by alternative media. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a complicated situation and, I, and I, I think it's something everyone's trying to navigate, especially as things get tense closer to the election in Turkey. Um, Lewin, do you have any any like specific suggestions of how we should navigate this? Because honestly, Ibrahim, I have the same question. Yeah, 
uh, I don't have a kind of a specific uh, experience or deep knowledge about that, that particular situation in Turkey and uh, this uh, Syria or situation because my specialty is in uh, the Southeast Asia. Especially we face that kind of uh, situation what Ibrahim mentioned about the uh, alternative media. So, so uh, as I understand from him, it's like a kind of the media who are pro-democracy and a pro as anti-government, I, I believe that. So, so this that's like kind of... Uh, uh, journalists and organizations definitely uh, face that uh, kind of uh, persecutions or oppressions by suppression by the authorities anyway. Either they close down your, uh, what I call, uh, source of the information or either you clo close down your publishing or uh, radio stations or arrest that or intimidate your journalists. So the, we have a situations like that and you know, a lot of journalists Journalists become a kind of a first target in that sense, in an hour. Whenever there's a conflict it happen, so they uh, a lot of the oppressive or regimes or militaries, and they first look at that, that uh, uh, their side of the story uh, to be out to the public. They don't want uh, such alternative media outlet to be carrying some sort of uh, anti that kind of uh, uh, military or anti uh, what I call dictators uh, message or information. So that's why they first looking at the situation to those kind of group and then uh, that's me in the sense of people, a lot of people flee the country. You know, I saw a lot of uh, journalists fled the country and then uh, uh, seek the kind of organizations uh, like an international organization. I know that I, uh, ICG, uh, FG, uh, help a lot of uh, these, uh, what I call, uh, displaced uh, journalists. There's a, a few programs I, I heard about that are uh, kind of materially or some sort of booklets. They also talking about the personal safety and security advice or something like that. So. Uh, like uh, like us, we're organized, uh, we're established organization. We do have a, a lot of uh, cautionary measures uh, to be uh, uh, deal with that in, in such a situations and you know, all uh, in the kind of hostile environment. How do we go around and how do we look after ourselves? But at the same time, our some sort of a stranger or uh, local reporters are also facing that some, some, sometimes same situation. So it is a, not that kind of a easy to answer question anyway, but uh, you know, we do have a sense. As a journalist, we know that we smell that the danger anyway. So um, we have to uh, deal with the situation according to. Yeah, so we have Dockers and Cheetahs live on the line, but before we go to them, uh, I have to take uh, two questions that we're typing. So the next one is this. Uh, currently, there is a debate in my newsroom concerning the right um, term to use when reporting refugee stories. Uh, do we talk of refugee camps or settlements? Some colleagues have the opinion that talking of camps is somehow diminishing uh, for refugees. So let's start with Lou, and I'll come back to Mudok on that. First one, and uh, we already uh, addressed it about the Nigeria. I feel that, but uh, about the terms, you know, it's just a little bit of um, I don't know. I never encounter about that kind of uh, argument or debate about uh, whether we should call uh, refugee camps or settlement. I feel that we we, we basically uh, talk about that uh, refugee camps, and uh, I don't know. So mostly, uh, as far as I know. Uh, we talk about that uh, refugee camps, you know, where we visited, where all those uh, displayed persons gather in the, this side of uh, our safety. Uh, these are the, or also few of them are recognized by local authority, uh, host country, or recognized by the UNHCR, and where, the, where all the international aid organizations determine that this is a, a place where they should deliver or organize there are eight organizations or relief organizations. These are the refugee camps or settlement, I don't know. Uh, this is a very much in English anyway, but uh, there's uh, some sort of uh, issue probably about uh, where, how do we refer uh, IDB, IDB camps or IDB settlement? That's another issue, you know, that there's a no such a kind of a well-founded or well-organized, what I call a flow of organization, how to reach that, um, uh, uh, how to reach that uh, aid or relief or something like that. But I, as far as I know, refugee camps, I wonder if it's uh, recognized and that there's a structure for the refugees them, for themselves, administrative structures and a relief distribution structures or something like that. So I think this is uh, my uh, vague answer. So Heather, I, 
Just the only thing to add is that you can ask the people who are living there. If they call it a camp, then it's fine. But if they don't like it, then we can find another term. No, so yeah, I like that reference. Chidoze, are you are you ready? Dockers, are you ready? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. can you hear me? Let's go with Chidoze followed by Dockers. Go back to that, please. Chidoze, you have the floor. Hello? Okay, Dockers. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Actually, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, greetings to everybody. I think it's a pleasure to be here. And so far, I've learned a lot from, um, uh, is it Lynn or Win and the mother? Um, so I'm Dr. Sekupe, I'm a Cameroonian residing in the far north region of the country um, where we have the menace of the Boko Haram sect, um, um, climate um, issues, and we also have the Minamawa refugee camp um, found in the Mayu Chinaga division, um, where a majority of um, the refugees are from Borno states, Nigeria. Um, I, I have a problem, um, just like um, one attendee uh, mentioned, to get into the camp, you know, you, you lots of um, 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 things to do. You write a letter there, you go there, you go there. Sometimes it's, it's very discouraging. And, and meanwhile, the camp has a lot of stories, you know, even the Sora of the camp, we have lots of um, unreported, meaningful and engaging stories that we can do in the camp, but, you know, access in the camp is, is really difficult and it's it's discouraging. Um, before we, we, we could enter there the way we, we wanted, but, you know, um, um, just of recent, um, you know, there have been these restrictions. So um, how, what's the way forward? You know, um, because I, I've, I've been in the camp, I've covered the story there with Plan International. And, you know, I when I got into the camp, I was just inspired, you know, life in the camp, lots of stories, like I said. So um, please, I just want to, to, to hear from you. And also, I want to say that the, the region has a lot of stories, the Far North region, it has a lot of stories. You know, um, sometimes I see these stories go unnoticed, you know, but I think um, being here, I've seen people that I think I could pitch my stories to. So thank you. And Chidoze, are you ready? Chidoze is, is muted. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Chidoze. Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, my name is Chidoze. I am a journalist, I'm also a publisher. I want to appreciate uh, all of you for this very important uh, meeting. Yes, uh, my questions. Um, uh, my question is, uh, is more or less uh, uh, with that of uh, Dockers. Yes, I want to ask, well, we have a lot of refugees here in uh, fleeing to Nigeria from other countries and uh, like most of them, you know, no database, there's no database. So none of them come with intention, you know, for, you know, to do a lot of crimes, commit a lot of crimes and a lot of atrocities and killings. And I want to ask each organization is really doing much to report such crimes, because I'm not sure we have a lot of, um, community reporters or refugee reporters, you know, here in Nigeria to report such incidents, you know, and as a journalist, sometimes I find it very difficult to have access to the camp where we can do stories on refugees and all that. You know, these are my questions. I don't know if uh, something is done from the nation to ensure that these uh, stories are covered. We have a lot of crimes being committed, you know, from other refugees entering to Nigeria. Okay. And so we have a lot of Nigerians too, we have a lot of Nigerians too who who are making their ways you know, in search of greener pasture to Libya, crossing the desert, you know, in search for a better living. And many of them, you know, have been killed. None of them have been kidnapped. So is, is there any mechanism or is there anything you people are doing to ensure that these stories are covered so that people will get to know about what is happening in the world? Thank you. So yeah, uh, who wants to go first? Mudok? Um, I can talk about the access to, uh, yeah, so you talk, the first question was about access and specifically to refugee camps in northern Cameroon. Um, I agree that, that that is so frustrating and I've been in many places in many countries where you want to go into a place, a specifically refugee camp, where, as you said, 
there's lots of stories, lots of people want to talk. And I mean, I was actually just, uh, last summer I was thrown out of a camp in Ethiopia, the Eritreans. What do you know about Eritrean refugees in Ethiopia? Not much because they throw all the journalists out of the camps. Um, at any rate, um, it's frustrating, but in terms of how to move forward, um, besides always continuing to play the game, do the paperwork, get the, get the permissions that you can, you can also do things Depends on the situation, but you can often find stories surrounding the camp. People leave the camp to go to jobs or to go to shopping or to, you know, try to find, uh, you know, a, a other resources that they can't get in the camp. So often I will find refugees on the streets outside of the camps if I can't get in the camp. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, in terms of the question about the, the last part of your question about Nigerians going to Libya and, and all of the crimes that happened to them on the way. Um, I think that is a very important topic that is also very undercover. Like if you go to a camp or a detention center in Libya, almost everybody has a story about how they or someone they love was kidnapped or raped or killed on the way. Um, it's, it's so unbelievably widespread. It is undercover, it should be covered more. And I hope you as a journalist are one of the people that takes it upon yourself. Um, to help, you know, to help let, get that story out as much as possible. Not to put the problem on you, just to say that it's universally not covered enough. Yeah, I like yeah. to add one thing about the, the access to the refugee camps. Of course, uh, it's a definitely is a very much a restricted. And most of it is a refugee camps, especially in the kind of a violent, violent situation. Especially mainly because of the, the, those kind of. Uh, uh, aid models so international organization and local authorities try to control their resources so how much they can supply and how much they can allow refugees to have access to the outside war or let them move, uh, move freely or something like depends on that but uh, another way i feel it uh, very very nice idea those uh, refugees who came out and uh, stay nearby uh, come out and uh, you try to talk with them but uh, those uh, Apart from those that are established at UN, of course, most of them are friendly, but uh, local authority are a little bit more strict. But uh, uh, inter international NGOs, uh, there's a various kind of hundreds of uh, 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 NGOs operating in a different areas uh, in the most of the refugee camps, either help providing help or food or education or something like that. These are may, these, those may be kind of uh, your uh, window, uh, kind of door to have access into. So you have, I, uh, I once uh, went into the camp uh, with that uh, one uh, INGO and then uh, uh, just simply uh, kind of uh, uh, pretending as a member of that, uh, I, that uh, part of the INGO. And I even uh, just simply went into the one uh, remote uh, unrecognized refugee camps in uh, that very much hostile area. Uh, together with uh, one Japanese monk, Buddhist monk, and I pretend I'm a, I'm an assistant, and I'm a, it's, it's a working for the, the Buddhist cause or something like that. So these uh, local authority being, uh, especially talking about my country uh, in Thailand, they are Buddhist. They revere or they respect the Buddhist monk. And you know? when, when you follow through that the Buddhist monk, you know, they, they, don't, they don't question much. Of that. You have to look for the, your own initiative and uh, do things. And also about the, the uh, crime. Of course, I'm very much uh, uh, support what uh, Heather said. You need to keep reporting on that and uh, make aware all those uh, authorities and international communities. The war know about uh, what happening uh, to these uh, poor refugees, especially that the refugees are not only exploited from their original place. They are, even after they arrive in the refugee camps, they are violated of their fundamental right to move around freely. They are violated of their, their rights to seek for the uh, what I call pay employment or something like that. So, but uh, so for that, you know, sometimes they they are being a victim of uh, human trafficking and then as somebody being threatened by the uh, gang, uh, violence gang or something like that. These are very much uncommon, uh, what I call, uh, occasion or situation we have. So our main duty is uh, just to keep report and look for the stories and uh, make aware of that situation. That's all we can do, I feel that. Yeah, or rather the very last question, and 
hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I can keep that promise. Um, so we have this, so if those does, I work with some Iranian refugees in Kabul in Afghanistan. It was a chance to document about refugees who were in one of the most refugee countries. Unfortunately, the Taliban arrested them 15 months. Me and my colleagues tried to ask from UNHCR about the situation, but did not give answers. So um, what are your recommendations regarding um, if somebody, if you have yourself dealing with, having difficulty tracking refugees that you are working with? So how do you think a journalist should go ahead with this? I think that uh, you can start with, sorry about that, but I think that the, um, if the UNHCR is not giving updates, then the only way is around. So um, what Lewin was saying, which was great advice about teaming up with a more friendly NGO, find out if the Red Cross or, or even smaller NGOs are involved and they might be able to share more information. Um, and the other thing you might be able to do, I'm not sure what your resources are, is try to locate their families in Iran and get them on the phone because if they are in Iran, far from the immediate danger of the Taliban, they might be more free to tell you what's going on. What do you think, Lauren? Yeah, there's a, nowadays a lot of uh, communication tools are available anyway. Uh, although you're not physically kind of going into there, you can just simply get the most information out of those local NGO, international NGOs or camp leaders or some people uh, through the telephones or something, you can get a, a lot of info, information out of there to report on. So of course, you know, they, they, to go there inside and do that, uh, see the locations and report firsthand is uh, nice, but sometimes, of course, we cannot get it. So, so sometimes if it is uh, too difficult and um, too, uh, what I call, uh, huge obstacles ahead, you know, we have to go around or something, we are a reporter, we need to report to something anyway. It's you know, whatever you have it, you know, and then we can describe the situation as well. This is a one reporting as well. For example, like if you have a, a had a very, very serious situation happen in a camp, but you are not allowed into, or you don't have access to the, and you, you, answer, you ask question to the authority, they didn't answer, they didn't let you go in there. This is a new again, I feel it. Okay, so um, I'll let you catch a breath about 30 seconds, I'll come back to you. Um, so uh, journalists, uh, I'd like to share some resources uh, with you uh, regarding um, how to report on uh, refugee communities. And the first one is, um, these are uh, really impressive uh, for uh, International Journalism Network, IJNet.org, which you have uh, on your screen right now. And um, it contains uh, the resources to guide you in reporting on different aspects of uh, refugee communities. And um, I'm going to put this link uh, in the chat box uh, so you can have quick access to the perspective of what aspect of refugee issues that uh, you are very interested uh, in reporting. And um, I'm trying to paste it here. Okay. So the link I just put in the chat box will take you um, where. I am. Thank you. I am. Um, you can easily uh, navigate, and um, I think it has everything. Uh, it has aspects of uh, narrative and research. It has aspects of technical production, uh, mental health, editorial approaches, safety and risk assessment. Uh, these are some of the issues that we've already discussed extensively today, and are uh, uh, inexhaustive. So please, uh, please. Uh, I don't personally. I don't think. Um, there is a one way approach to it. And like Doc has rightly pointed out, that advice on going to the markets to talk to refugees when the uh, international organizations seem to be doing a lot of gatekeeping uh, is actually a very good strategy. So please and please um, keep safe and uh, continue to do the reporting and whatever you think we can help you with that we'll be able to do that. So as we go into the last four minute stretch of the extra 30 minutes that we had to add to this session, I would like Hilda to start with uh, helping us with uh, a brief summary in one minute of what you think the take home message should be. And uh, Lauren should go 
Uh, what are your thoughts um, regarding the current state of uh, media coverage of refugee communities? What do you think uh, journalists should still do? What should they start doing? And uh, what are the prospects? So I start with him. Um, okay, thank you. I think uh, in terms of what take one of the things that are among the information in the link that you said that you sent is the information I didn't know where apparently a lot of stories about refugees don't include refugees voices and also don't say anything about the refugees um, such as their jobs or how many children they have or like something that makes them a person outside of the fact that they're a refugee. Um, all refugees are, you know, like that's a term, uh, but they're all just people that something extraordinary happened to. Um, and uh, it could happen to anybody just the same as it happened to that person. So um, I was surprised by those statistics that didn't include that information, but I guess it's something that we were reading this and we'll all take away from it that let's make sure not we're not part of that. Um, uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention like in that note, is, and this is kind of a little side note, is that we talk about IDPs, uh, internally displaced people. In that note, um, sometimes you see in writing IDPs written as, an, as, and there was 400 IDPs in the camp and then the IDPs got fed this amount of uh, sugar a month. So like also doing things like writing the acronym IDP instead of the families or the people, um, it does kind of depersonalize the situation. So. If, if I was to take anything away from this, and I wanted everyone to take away from it, is that your interest in refugees as people and covering them alone is, um, is enough to get started in terms of doing empathetic and um, uh, personalized reporting. So I hope everyone here continues to, to do more of it. Yeah. Thank you very much for the ICFJ for congratulations for your works with the uh, reporting on refugees and for all the journalists. And uh, main thing I like to uh, reemphasize what I have already said it is like uh, there's a lot of issues and you know, underlying issues on the uh, refugees. You know, so not only about the, the current crisis or emergency or something like that. The refugee issue is. Uh, uh, and solve long-term problems. So we have a lot of uh, situation we have to look into and uh, report so that uh, the war, what I call, uh, uh, notice uh, or uh, try to think in the other way you know, what actually happened to or something like that. For example, like a few uh, refugee camps, you know, like uh, Rohingya Muslim refugee camps. You know. I, I reported Rohingya refugee camps issue Back in 2000, back in 1991, so quite a long time ago, there was a crisis, you know, uh, nearly a half million Rohingyas fled. At the time, it was a kind of the uh, crisis and the, of the, uh, the war paid a lot of attention, UNHCR paid attention. Later on, the issue became a little bit of fading away. And then, but when you look at it, that whether these refugee camps are resolved or all the refugees uh, have uh, able to return home or resettle in the host country or it's different, no. There's a remaining refugees camp, thousands and thousands of them. And then there's another refugee crisis come back in 2017 again. And then the war kind of a lot, oh, there's another crisis and the refugees, the Rohingyas, and our baby attention again. So I'm afraid that there must be, a, there, will, there will be a, some similar incidents that happen for uh, uh, those refugees who are encamped in the, those kind of, uh, uh, they, 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 they are camps and then are without futures or something like that. So there's a lot of issue. And all, also very important that, that we didn't mention about, of course, we did a little bit mention about that uh, stigma or that uh, issue. When we are talking or portraying all the time refugee as a burden for the world community. And then those people are getting a problem and then they, we have to support or face or uh, the, the, at the cost of our communities or something like that. Uh, we, should, we cannot be portrayed in that way. Of course, there's a lot of issue we can just look at it. Like uh, those refugees who settle in America and in Europe, they contribute, how they contribute and how they become uh, who they are. And then uh, that's sort of positive situation, positive uh, reporting is important as well. And also uh, for that uh, 
a little bit of advocacy pro, uh, issue for the health and education, uh, women issue, uh, that kind of things. Uh, we have uh, so many issues and uh, things to report on. So mainly that's why my emphasis is uh, not looking at only into the uh, political crisis or climatic dramatic issues, which cause or which drove, uh, which drive refugees out of their original place. But there's a lot of issues uh, going on and uh, our duty, our responsibility is uh, to let uh, war aware of the situation and are willing to help. I think um, Lewin is really, really passionate about this, <laughs> about the subject, and I really, really agree with you, considering uh, especially your personal experience and um, the importance of the issue. Uh, something that you first said at the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation uh, it continues to resonate and continues to hold true, which simply means um, anybody at any time can naturally become a refugee uh, if the circumstances uh, work together to make an individual a refugee. And that's something that is really, really important in our reportage of um, uh, refugee communities in uh, different parts of the world. I want to appreciate uh, where our panelists today uh, You've been amazing, you've been extraordinary. I can see somebody even asking that this session requires, deserves certificates just to imagine how thorough you've been. So really, really thank you very much. And I know Eva promised us something uh, to share with our audience. If you can get across to me, I can pass it across to, uh, to them and I wish do that. And um, for those, I've also seen questions regarding when the video will be available. The video will be available on the ICT YouTube page tomorrow, by tomorrow. But if you are not interested in waiting that long, if you want to actually see the video today, there is a place for you to get that video as soon as possible. And that is our Facebook group. Uh, so you can already see that we are actually streaming this session live uh, on our Facebook page. So immediately this session is over. You can actually see um, the video uh, played on this. So I encourage you uh, to be part of our forum and join our community on, um, on Facebook. Um, all you just have to do is click the link that I put in the chat box and uh, you're going to be part uh, of that, uh, of that uh, forum and uh, we'll be able to share resources with you as much as we have, even um, facilitate whatever additional request that you have. So please and please do not stay to actively engage with us. And in addition to the resources that we shared from the International Journalist Network, there are several other resources uh, regarding uh, media reporting that I think you should check out on IGNet uh, website. So IGNet's website is really, really uh, easy to navigate. It's something I also meet personally uh, as a journalist. All you have to do is just go to IGNet.org. And um, so um, this is a page on refugee communities. If you just click IGNet uh, right away, it takes you uh, to the home page. And some of the things you can get on IGNet's website includes uh, the toolkit. Um, on different issues and you can also get access to uh, opportunities uh, for you training new job opportunities uh, for you as a, as a journalist. And to know more about this particular forum, my CJ Pamela Howard uh, Global Crisis uh, uh, reporting forum, uh, please check out ICFG website of www.icfg.org. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's amazing what we can do uh, when we have access to you as journalists. Please and please actively engage with us. And uh, we are part, we are glad that you can be part of the conversations today. So to everybody that stayed to the very end, this was a really, really long one. And uh, thanks to Lewin and Hilda uh, for being extra patient with us and um, enjoying the session. And um, thank you very much uh, to the amazing team at VOA. Uh, you made it uh, extraordinarily amazing for us. We enjoy working with you and uh, we look forward to doing more together. So to every participant, thank you very much and uh, mm -hmm. enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Good luck. Good luck. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Bye. 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 All the participants. Yeah.